Welcome back in another episode of the Off-Season Vodcast. That's a podcast on video for those of you who don't understand what a vodcast is. Shannon Dreyer alongside with me, James Osborne. You might know me as Boy Howdy. I'm going to grill Shannon today. I'm going to put her feet to the fire and I'm going to make her answer for some things that I need answers Grilling for. Grilling with Howdy. You should yes. have more like your, your like outdoor, you know, oh, chef like. I missed the opportunity. Your, your I could have brought my flipper. There I could have worn like my chef's hat. You set up the barbecue over here. I never come prepared for the pro with the props that I need. I'll tell barbecue stories from the, the road. That'll make up for it. <sighs> Oh, you can't do that. I'll be way too hungry. There's too much good brisket you get to eat out there. Anyways, uh, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to some World Series talk because there's some going on right now where depending on when you've watched it, it's already happened in the past. Um, and we're also going to get to some managerial search stuff. There's a lot of teams that have hired managers just in the last week and a half, particularly one within the AL West that's very interesting for Mariners fans. So let's start um, right there. Let's start with the managers. What have you been seeing so far with the different managers that have been hired for, hired to jobs in the last two weeks? You know, it's been a really interesting situation watching going into it, first of all, that there were so many managerial openings, and then seeing some of the names that you saw pop up um, on either ends of the spectrum, on the managerial spectrum. I look back to four years ago when the Mariners hired Scott Service, and there was all of this uproar. This guy's never had any uh, experience before and uh, now you're seeing that more and more and uh, you just look no further than what the Cubs have done and I believe it's official now we are it, it is Thursday we're in between World Series games there the used David to be, Ross era is beginning it in is Chicago. beginning but there used to be this big rule oh, you cannot announce anything during the World Series and about five years ago everybody decided well, we can announce things on the off day and today was kind of that day a big uh, kind of baseball news dump day as far as managerial hiring scope but David Ross I mean this this is a guy who has not managed before. This is a guy uh, who, yes, he danced. He was on Dancing with the Stars. Did Good he win him. that? Ooh, that's a great question. That's one of the reality TV shows I don't keep up I with. I don't I either, but I think he did very well. If he didn't win it, I think he was like top three. But uh, wildly popular Cub, very smart player, uh, very uh, smart, and had that reputation while he was with the Red Sox as well. But a guy that comes in and his baseball experience is limited to what he did on the field, as well as being a special assistant to the general manager. We see a lot of those running around with the Mariners. And I think a lot of people ask me, well, what does Ken Griffey Jr. do? What does Ichiro do? What is Mike Cameron doing? What are all of these special assistants doing? A lot of times that depends on the ex-player themselves and what they want. Most of the time, let's be cynical. Let me be cynical and then you don't have to be. Most of the time, these people are getting paid to be associated with the team. Well, I would say that, but I think that they, uh, this group in particular, it, it's not a matter of going out to car dealerships and signing autographs like it used to be. Uh, I'm talking kind of way back then. Um, I think that players are seeing this as an avenue to get more active in the game and to get a more full-time job in the game, which I always find fascinating. If I had a big league career that lasted 10, 15 years and I was set for life, I'm not sure I would dump back, jump back into day in, day out baseball. It's uh, I mean, Especially the days are right insane. away too, right? The days you're talking 12, 14, 16 hour days, you know, no weekends off, no freedom to go to your kid's birthday party or your mom's birthday or anything like that. I, I find it hard to believe that so many are so eager to get back into it. Yet that's what we're seeing, which I guess if you're a baseball person, that's what you do. You know, so um, I, I think we're seeing more and more these jobs turn into, well, what do you want to do? Well, I might want to do this. Okay, go to these meetings, go visit this affiliate. I think you're seeing them do a lot more uh, in attempts to find what they want to do more long term. So David Ross did that for two years. And so he is coming in uh, with minimal experience. You look at, you know, when you looked at Scott Service, he'd been in front offices, he'd, he'd been in development for a long time. David Ross is about as close as you go from being on the field and into that manager's chair. So that'll be interesting. And it's very interesting to see the Cubs do that because the Cubs, one of the more number-oriented teams, all teams are using it now. Cubs are in the upper echelon of how they use it right now. And also going to be very interesting in that he's got relationships with those players. That can mm. be a good thing. That can also be a bad thing. Mm. You don't want to be too familiar. So very, very interesting hire. Mets are looking at Carlos Beltran pretty closely right now. That's going to be really tough. Whoever the Mets hire to look at and be like, that was an educated decision. 
that team definitely knows what they're doing. <laughs> That's going to be really, really hard for me. Even if it is Carlos Beltran, who everyone says is a great mind and a right, great person and right. somebody who knows the game inside and out, front and back, not just from an old school perspective, but he's a willing to embrace the new stuff. Yeah. That's going to be a tough one for me when they hire whoever it is to say that was an educated, well-informed decision. Interesting to see Buck Showalter get interviews with multiple teams. <laughs> Buck Showalter is getting interviewed by multiple teams. The hey, guy who like him or hate him, he's a great baseball person. Well, he did he's let the order Orioles get run person. straight into the ground. This is true. This to is the true. worst organization in baseball. Not to say that everything else around him isn't worse than he was, but he took a team that was sort of average and by the end was a complete abject disaster. Well, yeah, that's a good way to put that. Um, Ron Washington interviewed. I'm sorry to see him not get a job, mm. uh, but obviously very old school, but also uh, you're not going to find a better instructor. Mm. And I think, uh, you know, a great leader, too, in Ron Washington. So uh, he was interviewed. Um, you've seen a lot of bench coaches from teams interviewed. Joe Girardi got hired by the Phillies today. Yeah, what do you think of that? I, I think that, you know, he came from the Yankees. They do like to use the numbers. I think he is still very, I don't want to say old school. And I think when we look at old school, we're looking at Lou Pinella kicking dirt and things like that. That is so far gone right now. Uh, Joe Girardi, a very smart baseball person, but he is a, a manager that will go with experience and gut. And the new kind of more numbers guys will not. They will play the percentages straight. And the only way to make that work is to play it straight throughout the entire season. Mm. That's not Joe Girardi. He is going to manage his team as he has managed teams before. So um, I find that interesting. And the Phillies are at the absolute bottom rung of analytically inclined teams. Mm. So that is something uh, that I think is a good fit there. Uh, of course, there is Joe Madden. Yes, this is the big one. This is the one that AOS fans, the Mariner fans, are waiting to hear the analysis of Shannon Dreher on. The Angels hired Joe Madden, widely considered to be perhaps one of the two best coaches of the last 20 years in baseball. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's got to be him and Tito, right? Like, there's nobody else on that list in baseball, is there? Well, he just got let go by the Cubs. Well, I mean, yes. you look at that. It's, yeah. it's not perfect. And I think that... Um, Tito, absolutely. I have him up there, and he's a guy that has been able to balance and to survive as it has gone into this different era and bring his strong it's Terry Franco, who is now with the Indians, was previously with the Boston Thank Red Sox. You. If you don't know who Tito is. Um, I, I think that the problem with Madden is, uh, and what they're saying about Ross, is his biggest challenge will be not being Joe Madden. And we know Joe Madden from his raised days where they're operating as shoestring. They have to look to maximize everything. They have to look to get edges in different directions. And you heard all the stories, and I've seen them. I, I saw the python in the clubhouse. I, I saw the penguins in the clubhouse. And not at the same time, thankfully. That would be an absolute disaster. Uh, that stuff is fun, but I, I think that there are also things about they had no required batting practice ever. You could show up whatever time you wanted to in the clubhouse. And I don't think that worked for the Cubs. So hmm. I think that, you know, was that Madden or was that him tailoring something to where he was at at the time? Um, I don't think that will work for the Angels. So for me, there's, there's a little bit of intrigue there in how do you balance that stuff? Because I think with Joe Madden, there's a persona and a personality and everything else. There's also a shrewd side with the numbers. He knows the numbers. He knows the metrics. He's a smart manager on top of that. Um, so I'm interested to see how it works there because I don't think it worked this year in Chicago. Hmm. So for me, that, that'll be interesting. And the Angels are a mess right now. Uh, we don't know how everything that came out about Tyler Skaggs is going to play out. And that's going to be a shadow over that team for some time right now. They also, you know, payroll-wise, You've still got two more years with Albert Pujols, just ridiculous dollars committed to. You've got some great prospects coming up. You've got Otani hopefully coming back, although what we've seen from him so far, can't stay healthy. You've not been able to have the Shohei Otani that you've wanted to have. Uh, if you do have him, he's going to be a spectacular player. We've seen enough of that on both sides of the ball. But um, a lot going on there. I don't think that's an easy position to jump into. Um, you talk about you've got to have that great relationship with the GM if you're the manager. In Anaheim, you have to have that great relationship with the owner. Yeah, Artie Moreno is the one who's pulling strings for better or for worse, and sometimes it's for worse. Um, Josh Hamilton, that was his call. Albert Pujols, that was his call. It was sometimes tough to manage with that. You always want a guy that's going to spend a lot, but you want them to spend on the right guy, and that has not happened there. So this is where I think that this, this hire specifically 
is an incredibly short-term hire for the Los Angeles Angels. They are making this hire because they see a window of opportunity with Shohei Otani and Mike Trout, and they, they say, we need to do whatever it takes in the next two years to take those two guys mm -hmm. with Andrew and Simmons to the top. That's it. And for Joe Madden, he's got a shot to do that. That said, with a meddlesome owner, and a team that just has lacked identity since the beginning of time. <laughs> like, they haven't had an identity since Jim Edwins was roaming around out in the outfield. Like, that team has no identity, and they haven't been able to create one. Right. And, and their owner is meddlesome, like you said. They spend close to $200 million often. Like, it's just, it's crazy. And they still can't put an above-average team on the field with the best player in baseball. So I think there's a chance this works in year one. Less of a chance it works in year two. But ultimately, this is a combustible situation. It's going to blow up in their faces, and they're going to end up putting themselves so far behind the eight ball. Watch them go trade Joe Adele sometime oh, in the next year. Watch them go do please. that. That'd because be Because they're going to look By at themselves and say, we need to give ourselves the best shot to win right now because they're desperate, and this is a desperate move for them. And I don't think they're going to get Garrett Cole. That would be something. I mean, they're going to I mean, need they're to. Gonna, they're going to jump into that. They're going to have to. A lot of teams are going to jump into that. Why does Garrett Cole want to go to that situation right now? Because you get to play with Mike Trout. Why did Shohei Otani want to go there? Yeah, because but what did they get Shohei Otani? Are they that much closer right now? Yeah, now with Joe Madden. So this, this is the difficult part. Like, this is when sports start to transcend each other and they cross over. In the NBA, people want to play with the very best players. And sometimes when the money is close or even, they'll just pick, like, I want to be associated with LeBron James. I want to be associated with Steph Curry. And I think some of that happens with Mike Trout. I mean, you get stodgy old base writer, baseball writers who are willing to already say that, Joe, that Mike Trout is the best player that's ever played in baseball. Baseball writers hate giving credit to anyone, let alone somebody who's not even 30 years old yet. And they're willing to go out and put their name on the record saying this guy's the best player that's ever played baseball so I think that somewhat plays into this whole realm of they Garrett Cole may legitimately end up there because of that element right there but I think this is a short-term window for them and this is a combustible situation if I was Joe Madden I went I kept going down I-5 and I landed with the Padres that mm. would have been my choice I mean mm. that's a team that is on the up that is a team with a farm system they spend it's money a team that can spend money uh, I haven't looked too into it. They should have done something this year, and they didn't. You know, they're a little bit late in their window right now, which I suppose I should look a little bit more into because that's uh, an outcome you could see with the Mariners down the road. We yep. don't know where that's going to end up, but um, I that just does not look like a good situation on multiple levels. To Let's transition the to the World Series then because hey, hey. We, uh, we've got a big series going on right now, the Washington Nationals, yeah. the Houston Astros. Uh, the Astros, to me, have all season long, and especially this playoff run, proved that they're the most talented team in baseball. I think they're just unreal and ridiculous. But I'd love to get your perspective on how this series is sort of transpiring, um, how the Nationals were able to come out to a two games to nothing lead. And I really want to actually have a conversation about starting pitching because mm -hmm. all of baseball has been telling us for the last three or four years that the only thing that matters is home runs and bullpens. That's all that's mattered. And this series, to me, is proving that starting pitching, having a big three is more important to be have, being a great team than anything. So I'd love your take on what's going well, except on. Except the Astros have a big three and it hasn't saved them right this now. This series it hasn't, but yeah, yes. I think they were a little shaky the last series too. Justin Verlander has not had a great postseason. They've had, you know, they, I, I tweeted out that they, uh, you know, congrats to the Nats who got the Astros on their win day in game one. And a win day for me is if your team has an ace, there's a different feeling in that clubhouse on that day. We saw it with Felix for years and years and years, but players came into the, into the clubhouse, to the ballpark that day, knowing that they were going to win that game. And when you don't win that game, when you steal that win game, that is a momentum shift in any series, be it a seven game, a three game, a two game, that, that's big when you take that away. And the Nationals were able to do that in getting to Cole. And I was shocked by that. I'm not shocked. I, I've seen Justin Verlander, he can be got at times. I've seen it in the regular season. I've seen it in the postseason. So I wasn't shocked to see that from him. I was shocked to see Garrett Cole come out. And for that to happen on a day where Max Scherzer didn't have his location or his command, that was amazing. And I think, you know, for all that we talk about pitching, it's offense that right now is driving the Nats. It is. I think you're absolutely right. I think it's really difficult to overlook the fact that the reason why these two teams had such great success and were able to not go through the serious doldrums of huge losing streaks is because they had real starting pitching. 
real top three starting pitching for the Nationals. You had Scherzer, Strasburg, mm -hmm. and Corbin. I mean, no matter there. what happens, we'll get you there. you've got those three guys that right. are going to give you the best chance to win against virtually every opponent on three days out of your five-day calendar. I think that's a huge impact. And for the Astros, where did they go spend their money? Where do they spend their resources? They added Verlander. They added Cole over time. They spent it all. Greggy and Sanchez. Greggy and Sanchez. They spent all of their resources on starting pitching, not on bullpen. They were able to build a great bullpen, don't get me wrong. And they they spent money to build a bullpen. They both have over the course of time. And bullpens are fickle. They change every year, no matter how much you pay them. So I'm not saying they ignored pitching, or they ignored no, bullpen. No, no, not at but all. But they, these teams made a clear investment that the way we're going to win and the way we're going to give our chance the, ourselves the best chance in the playoffs is by having a great rotation. And all of baseball is going the other direction. It is. Uh, no, you'd like to. You just can't. There aren't enough great arms out there to, for everybody to have a three deep great rotation yeah, right so now. Everyone wants that. Yes, but kidding? everyone's strategy then is to say, all right, forget it. We're not going to overspend. We're not overspending on these top three. We're going to go out and we're going to go spend tons of money on our bullpen. That's how teams are approaching their pitching staffs now. That's because they can't get the starter. If they were given the preference, they absolutely Sure, but starting pitching contracts starter. aren't 10 years anymore, and they were at one time. Oh, barely. But they're they're not now. Barely. You're talking about Garrett Cole coming out, and the difference between him signing one place or another is going to be six to seven year contracts. That I mean, there is a limit that teams are putting on something that, that they know for sure. Ten-year contracts. What are you talking the, the, about? But the fact that the the ceiling is lower there is an indication oh, of how I think the market the premium is gone. Is still on the starting pitcher. I think you've seen uh, the slugger that has bottomed for out. Sure. You've seen the reliever come up a little bit, but not the crazy closer number. You don't see closers with a premium on them. No, but you anymore. see lefty specialists making six million dollars. Not a year. anymore. Not anymore. You see lefty specialists are sitting at home right now. You've got to do more than get just one. You're, you're talking two years ago, three years ago, when that was happening. Right now, no. I, I, the premium still very much is on the starter and that value of that one win every five days. And you're right. If you compare that with one or two more, you're set as long as they stay healthy. Um, I think what has shocked me about this, and it was so fun to watch it last night, is, hey, a baseball game broke out. You know, we looked at this going in and going, oh, it's going to be a pitcher's duel. Um, but because, you know, we don't know as much about the Nats, but you look at that rotation and that's a darn good rotation. You know that right there. We know too much about the Astros right now. But to look at last night's game and holy cow, they're pushing the pitchers past 100 pitches. Oh my gosh, how often do you see that now? Disaster is going to befall both teams. Is that a bunt? They just bunted. What just happened? You know, a baseball broke out is what happened. Yeah. And it's been a lot of fun. Uh, to watch. So, no, I think they're, they're built similarly in that they both have the rotations. Uh, Nats don't have a bullpen, and Dave Martinez has been willing to push that rotation because of that, and I love it. I was thrilled to see Patrick Corbin come out in game one. I thought that was, and just the philosophy there, you can't get four unless you get one. Let's get one right off the bat. And how audacious is that to say we're going to get that off of Garrett Cole? It tells you a little something about that manager, that clubhouse, the confidence in that team and his starters and that he used two of them and I, I would have liked to have seen Corbin for another inning to be uh, honest with you because you knew at that point he's probably not making a start could have been a bullpen day but no they're going to go with uh, Sanchez instead uh, a couple days later but no for me uh, I, I think they both have very strong rotations and I, I, I still think that is that's the premium is on the starter I don't think that's been lessened. Well, this has been a good way to transition into the Mariners, Mariners. because I'm now going to put your feet to the fire. That wasn't my feet on the fire? No, that was not your okay, feet Okay, we're on the grilling fire. now. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to put your feet to the fire on some Mariners related When do we fire at the stove? This is the grill, um, and then we move to the oof, stove yeah, we, afterwards? Yeah, we do the grill first. We okay. get all of our grilling out of the okay. way, and then we'll work on the baked the embers, beans and the stove. The embers, the charcoals going, um, the wood chips. I want to grill you on a few specific Mariners okay. and what you think happens to them, maybe this offseason, or just how they fit into the Mariners' plans. Okay. And I'm going to start with the very hardest one, Mitch Hanniger. Where does Mitch Hanniger fit? Because I personally believe that Mitch Hanniger made a business decision last year and shut it down and said, I'm not playing. I'm not doing this. I, he, got, he got the ruptured testicle, which is a terrible injury. Um, I recently was on a podcast, and this player, this NFL player, told me about how he got testicular cancer during the season, had his testicle removed, which is a common thing that happens when you have testicle injuries, and two weeks later was playing in an NFL game. Mitch Hanniger had a, his testicle ruptured, had a procedure, had a setback, then got a sore back, had a setback, and ended up missing 100 games of baseball. 
What, how, how can you explain that? How do you describe that when Adrian Beltre had a similar thing happen where he ruptured his testicle and within two and a half weeks he was back on the field? How can he miss an entire season from that injury? Okay, Adrian wasn't back in two and a half weeks, but he also is Adrian Beltre, so I just go ahead and say that right there. He is Superman. Um, uh, I'll flip it on you. How's that a business decision? How does that benefit Mitch Hanniger not playing? Mitch Hanniger looks at this season and says, I thought we were going to be competitive, and we weren't. And I don't want to be a part of something that's not competitive. I'm not going to put my name, my brand on that. I'm going to sit this out, wait until I'm perfectly 100% Miguel Cabrera healthy, and I'm not going to play anything less than 100% healthy, and I'm going to wait until I get back on the field, show everyone what I am, and get traded. I'll go ahead and say, as far as a business decision goes, it's probably not too smart if you're an arbitration-eligible player to sit out 100 games and, you know, that, sure, traded and going somewhere might be great, but you're not getting paid more for being traded and going. You're losing money when you're not playing, when you are an arbitration-eligible player. And he just missed a significant amount of time. So I don't see that at all. Plus, he is an older arbitration-eligible player. And further arbitration salaries will be based on what he makes next year. What he makes next year is based on what he did this year. He didn't do anything before he got hurt. I would assume that if he wanted to up his value, he knew he needed to get back out on the field and do something better than he did before he was hurt. So, so I don't see I'll that, buy that. I'll, as a business I, as absolutely decision I agree in the with least you on that. that would be a dumb business decision. I agree with you mind. that it is a bad business decision in the short term. But I'm trying to figure out how you can miss 100 games from a testicle injury and a sore back. That's what I'm well, trying you know, to figure it's a out. Was sore back or was it something more? I don't know. That's what that's what team team reporters. I think Greg Johns put it out. That he had a sore back and they shut him down again. Yeah, after he had a back rehab. injury. Okay, I haven't heard injury. That's a different deal than soreness in his back. To me, that's a very different thing. A back injury is like whoa. Soreness watch out. isn't going to keep you out for a hundred games. So you think he, he had a legitimate rehab injury that kept him out for 100 games? Well, I'll tell you what I know. I know that when you are shut down and when you have surgery, well, let's start. When you are have surgery, that is going, especially if it's anywhere in a core area, and he has had core issues before, hmm. it is going to take a longer time to come back from that injury. You can't, you know, things need to heal, and that's not a matter of trying to compensate here or compensate there. Um, he was down with the surgery and recovering from the surgery long enough that everything else, and he couldn't do anything while he was recovering. And baseball is very rotational. And that was a, a point where he would have to build up almost from scratch again. And that's nothing that you can rush, and it was nothing that they were going to rush. Um, because let's go ahead and flip it and look at the Mariners' value for it. They need him back 100%. If you're Mitch, you want to come back quickly. That benefits you more. If you are the Mariners, it benefits you more if he comes back right, which is going to take longer. That's very fair. Very fair. Um, and what I know of it, and I, I will grant this, um, it was odd that we never heard specifically what the injury was. Um, was around him enough to see that there was frustration with where he was and trying to get and not able to get there. Um, and also, I do know that because you're assuming there wasn't an injury, he just said, I'm done, I'm going to get back on my I'm own. assuming he wasn't 100%, that he was 90 and was like, mm, tell him 100, I'm okay. not coming back. Okay, yeah. Um, I do know that he had to stay in Seattle for a couple of weeks after the season to continue with his back rehab. Mm. So mm. that to me is fairly significant mm. if he is still doing that, if he's not going home to California. I don't think that, you know, if he was all about him and taking care of just him at that point, he would have been out on the first flight that's, at the end of the season. That's great inside information. And that's why we do this, because we can get some actual, real, hardcore information. So thank you for that. The next player I want to grill you on is Marco Gonzalez. Hmm. Marco Gonzalez had a statistically almost identical season yeah. last year to the year <laughs> before. So, is Marco Gonzalez a foundational piece of the playoff Seattle Mariners? You betcha. Really? You betcha. Tell me why. Wow, that came out really quick. Um, because you need that number three guy in the middle who's going to make every start who is going to, and I, 
Statistical at the end, yes, how he got there completely different. Great start, very good finish, disastrous month in the middle of the season. Young player, learn stuff this year. Let's say you can minimize that disastrous month in the middle of the season. That's a very different statistical year. I mean, when you're talking statistic, you're talking about what his ERA was. You're talking about... Walks, strikeouts, hits allowed, whip. And he did so with, what, about 40 more innings this year? I think it was like 12. I think it was really, really close. I'll have to relook it up. I'm sure all of you will comment in the YouTube comments section. But I, I don't think it was a significant amount, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing for him was you feel good about him taking the ball every five days. He's going to give you a very good chance, not just a chance, but a good chance to win a ball game when he goes out there. You need that guy in your playoff roster. Uh, he is, he's shown that he can go the length of the season. He was one of what, I think it was 14 players that pitched 200 innings this year. There's value in that, and they were 200 pretty good innings. Is he an ace? No. Is he a number one? Uh, in mentality, yes, but no, not in a... a, a playoff team, but I'm also willing to look at him and say, let's watch him continue to develop because we saw him take major steps forward this year in that last year was kind of an adjustment year for him and figuring out what he had, learning about that cutter. This year he couldn't use that cutter. You couldn't cut the baseball this year. And so he learned how to pitch without it. Hmm. And he didn't take any step backwards. Hmm. One bad month on fire at the beginning. You know what kind of competitor he is. You, I think he's still doing a little bit of this right now. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, I think there is a lot of value. Okay. Um, and, well, and did that on a team where he didn't have anything around him. That's fair. You don't need to motivate mm -hmm. him. He's a competitive guy. What's he going to do if it's a, on the upswing? I'm interested to see it. And, I, yeah, especially when you're not paying him anything right now. I don't trade him. I think he's exactly the kind of guy that you need to build around. He's not the key piece by any means, but uh, I think he's a foundation in that he can hold, he showed he can hold down a rotation this year. Is Omar Narvaez the starting catcher on the Mariners playoff team? No. Why? Because he's probably traded in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Let's, so th there's a similar conversation <laughs> to be had here between Marco Gonzalez and Omar Narvaez because both are not very, really making very much money. Both are performing at an above average spot at their positions and both are relatively young. So why yes on Marco Gonzalez and no on Armand Arvaez? By the way, I'm no on both. For well, this Marco the Gonzalez is not the worst at anything he does, for starters. Omar Narvaez is great. He got so much better during the season. No. He's so much better. He's not, almost not, average not, on defense. But he really is oh, he's not. so much better. He is. Sadly, he is not. I wish he was. I know that he worked hard. I know that there was improvement. I know that defensive metrics for catchers are all over the board. He's still at the bottom. And uh, I, it's... You look at what they have right now, and if you're looking for an area of strength to make a deal from, it's catching. You know, we talked about it last out, uh, last outing. We talked about it last vodcast. Um, Austin Nola is catching in the Dominican Republic right now. That to me says he'd like to catch next year. He, uh, everything I heard from the coaches, from some of the numbers that I saw, and uh, the pitchers in particular, he's a good catcher. Do you like Tom Murphy? Sure, why not? I don't know if you can do that again, but why not? Sounds good. Yeah. And who's your catcher of the future? I mean, it's got to be, uh, what's his face from USC? Cal Raleigh. Yeah, Cal Raleigh. So you've got a little bit of excess in catchers right now. Omar Narvaez, great offensive numbers. Find that offensive club for him and get him there. Okay. Domingo Santana, is he an outfielder on the Mariners playoff team? No. Will he be here come, <laughs> come, come April? Will he be on the team come March? Um, I don't think so. I, I don't think, uh, you know, they want to move the young outfielders quickly. He is in the way of the young outfielders. Um, he just defensively did not cut it this year. I, I think that he filled a need, and I, it was, you know, it was unfortunately when you saw the season start and he was on fire, he was hitting home runs and, and everything else, you're like, wow, what a steal for Ben Gamble. And then you saw what happened as the rest of the season went on, and then you remember, well, you traded him for Ben Gamble. So mm -hmm. I, I think that you probably got about, and this was, just to refresh, they needed a right-handed bat. They had no use for Ben Gamble anymore, which is unfortunate. Ben was one of my favorite players to watch. Um, 
so this was kind of one of those, this isn't a long-term thing. We need something right now. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Uh, if you've got Daniel Vogel back at DH, I don't think you have room for another DH. I think that's what Domingo Santana okay. probably is. My last two as we wrap up here. Daniel Vogelback and Malik Smith. Are they both on the team? Come what race? Okay, right. Whoa, whoa. Ah. Twice around the bases for Malik, once for Daniel. Um, come March, are they both on the team? I think so. I do think so. Interesting. Um, well, Vogelback's going to be your DH, possibly holding down some time at first base, although that could be more NOLA until Evan White is ready. I think we're going to see Evan White early in the season. I agree. So, uh, Daniel's going to have to make some noise quick. And Which he did last year and then didn't. Right. And so, yeah. I don't know what that's going to tell you about Daniel Vogelback if he has a hot start next year, well, in my opinion. You know what? I think what's going to tell me about Daniel Vogelback is what we see in spring training. I mean, this was a year where he fell short, and he's he had a full year to show himself at the big league level. Now, okay, you've seen everything now. You've had that year. You know what you need to do. What do you do when you come into spring training? I, I want to see, you know, what does he look like? Um, I want to see, and I'm not saying that he's got to look like Franklin Gutierrez when he no, goes out No, but he can't there. add 35 pounds during the middle of the season. No. And as a guy who's gained weight, I can feel comfortable saying that I believe that Daniel Vogelback gained some weight during the season. He did not look like the same player at the end of the season that he did at the beginning to me. No, he didn't. And that's not rare either. in baseball. It's not like he's the only player that's ever happened to, but he looked like a completely different guy by the time September rolled around compared to what he was in April. So I think that's an issue, and it's something they got to figure out. And for Malik Smith, that's a guy who I think in a lot of ways had a kind of up-and-down season, and the Mariners clearly have an outfield of the future that they have penned down in the minor leagues. And I have a tough time seeing him as anything more than a fourth outfielder. So the question becomes, is there enough value now that if they were able to move on from him, could they get something back at another position that they feel like that could potentially be a contributing piece in two years? I don't think they could, so I don't think that they do hmm. at this point. But uh, Malix, we saw him work throughout the season, and I, I don't think there's anything wrong with being that fourth outfielder. And what he's able to do and steal a base, too. Unfortunately, they are a couple of years away from needing that yeah. type of player. But in the meantime, uh, he is not blocking anyone. And as a fourth outfielder, uh, you know, I don't think Jake Fraley is going to start the season with a big club. I think he's going to need some time at AAA. Um, uh, unless you are able to get something, I don't think you give Malik Smith away. I think that they are comfortable in that, um, who he is, how he works. And I, I, I think that if there's an opportunity, yes. If not, I don't think it's a priority to trade him. I think you're probably looking. If they don't trade him, he's on the team, and I don't think that's a problem. Great. Well, I think that's all we've got for this episode. Uh, a little bit of a shorter one for you guys. I don't know what we're going to talk about next time. Do you? Well, the World Series will have ended. Yes. Uh, five days after the World Series, uh, clubs will have to have uh, picked up their options. So we will have free agents the next time. Uh, we A lot of free agents the next time we do one of these. So we can get a little bit more into the hot stove type stuff. I understand that you've been doing some research and some fun facts and some... Oh yeah, I got some interesting Mariners facts for you from the last season. And you're gonna have to tell me which player is which and uh, how many players fall into some certain categories statistically that I thought were very interesting. I was surprised. All right, Howdy gets into it. Yes, so that's all for today. <laughs>